Well, good evening, everyone. So glad you took some time to be with me tonight as once again we study the Word of the Lord together. Before we get started, you know what to do. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that you love them in Jesus' name. And again, if you're watching this by yourself, why don't you text somebody, tell them that you love them. I know it'll make their evening. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to invite you to open them with me to the book of Matthew. We're going to go to Matthew 24 and verse number 3 here in just a moment. As you're turning there, let me just remind you that last week we talked about overcoming offense. And I got a lot of response from that. Just some people that reached out and really said how this was helping them. And along my study last week, there were some other thoughts that really emerged. And I thought that I would come back tonight and talk a little bit more of offense, but a very specific kind of offense and one that we need to really make sure we guard our heart against in Jesus' name. And again, I'm just going to pick up here at Matthew 24, verse number 3. It says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us. When will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. And we'll end right there. Now, there are probably some of you that know that this particular portion of Scripture, in fact, all of Matthew 24, is often referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Um, and this is really the clearest teaching of Jesus on his second coming. And it was delivered exclusively to his disciples on the Mount of Olives, hence the Olivet Discourse. And you may remember that he was asked, in light of his provocative prophecy of the destruction of the temple, which incidentally occurred in 70 AD, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And it's at this point that, as we just read a moment ago, Jesus would break into a list of various signs that would point to the nearness of the end of the age and his second coming. And as you go through this list, you realize very quickly that none of them are necessarily new. There's, there's not one of those signs that really sticks out to you and, and really sets itself apart from all the rest as being something that we have not seen. In fact, these things have always been seen. Really, from the very first sin of man, we have seen the evolution of each one of these signs. But you have to understand that what Jesus was actually saying here was not that these would be new signs, but rather that these signs would become more frequent and would become more intense as we draw closer to the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The illustration that I have used through the years um, as I have shared these things with you would be that of road signs the closer that you get to your destination. And, you know, let's, let's just say you were driving north from Florida to Philadelphia. You might see a sign that says 300, 400 miles to Philadelphia. And then you might see one that says 200 miles to Philadelphia. And then sporadically you would see them, but the closer that you got to the city of Philadelphia, the more frequent those signs would be. 
And then you would actually notice an intensification of the information, if you will, on those signs. You'd start seeing signs for hotels. You would start seeing signs for restaurants or for various entertainment along the way. Um, you would see uh, law firms and divorce uh, lawyers and all of these things the closer you get because they want you to be alert that your exit is approaching and you need to be paying closer attention. Well, that's really the way that Christ is describing these signs as well. He's saying, I know these signs have always been with you, but the closer that you get to my second coming, the more frequent these signs are going to be and the more intense they're going to become, providing even more information of the imminent return of Christ. And so that is how they're to look at it. And really, we've heard them all before. Widespread deception, wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, famine, disease, earthquakes, hatred for those who call upon the name of Jesus Christ and hold fast to his word. And again, all of these have been with us, but we have seen in recent days these are becoming more intense, and they're happening much more frequently. But of all of the ones that are on this list, and the ones that we tend to speak of, the one that is often overlooked, the one that we pay very little attention to, is escalating offense. Jesus actually warned us that the closer we got to the coming of the Lord, we would see a dramatic escalation of offense. He warned us that many would be offended, that they would betray one another, and that they would even hate one another. Now, we need to make sure that we keep this in context. And I want you to remember what we talked about last week, and that is that the Bible does not really seem to concern itself with the simple offense that we can experience on almost a daily basis where someone says something or does something that offends us. Even though that can be serious, that is not really how the Bible views offense. The, the way that the Bible looks at the subject of offense is when it becomes an occasion for us to stumble back into sin. When, when the scriptures really deal with offense, that's really what the, the primary concern of the Word of God is, is that we need to always be on guard, that we are never allowing an individual to have that kind of influence on our life where their life could become an occasion for us to stumble into sin, but also warning us not to become an occasion of sin for someone else. But here tonight, he is talking about a very specific offense, an offense that will increase the closer that we get to the coming of the Lord, and that is the offense of the gospel. It is the idea that men and women will become increasingly and more intensely offended by the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Literally, these are men and women that are highly, highly offended that Christ has said such, again, provocative things and calls us to such a radical transformation in our hearts and in our lives. You know, something that all of us would be good to remember, um, and it would be good for us to remember, is that the gospel, whenever it is spoken of, whenever it is taught, whenever it is communicated in its purest form, in its unadulterated and uncompromised manner, will always be offensive. Even Christ, when he is presented in, um, again, an uncompromised, unadulterated manner, he will always come across offensive. You know, I have learned that in, in many ways uh, through my life. You know, when I preach, and I had mentioned this on Sunday, when I preach, I tend to be hard when I preach and, and uh, you know, just kind of come across, you know, 
this way or the highway. When I'm counseling, when I'm sitting with men and women, especially those who are not even in the faith, I try to be very merciful. I try to be very compassionate. I try very hard to couch my words in such a way that I am not purposely trying to offend. But I have discovered that no matter how merciful, no matter how loving I try to be, that eventually the message is going to be offensive. Because eventually the Word of God is going to call us out on our lifestyle, on our way of thinking, on our way of living, and it is going to offend us. That is just the reality. And I think it would be good for us to remember that because if you think that everybody is just going to love Jesus and love the Word of God if it's presented in the right way, then you're going to feel this responsibility to sand out the rough edges of the gospel in order to make it more appealing. It's just better for us to go into the presentation of the gospel, whether that is preaching or that is just simply sharing the faith with a loved one or a family member or a friend, that this is going to be offensive, that I'm going, to, I'm going to share it lovingly and I'm going to share it with great compassion, but I need to know that this is going to offend at some level. That is going to be a, a better way to look at it. Because if I, again, think that Jesus will always be accepted by men and women when he's presented the proper way, then we're going to look for ways to compromise the gospel to make Jesus look better and that is not going to be effective at all in fact it could put people in eternal peril we need to be very careful and understand that when Christ is presented in truth and without compromise he is going to be offensive the gospel is going to be offensive Jesus himself said that, not just me. In Matthew chapter 10 and verses 34 through 36, he says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. Now, again, understand, Jesus didn't come to bring a sword. It wasn't, you know, in his mind he wanted to be offensive. He just knew that the gospel he was going to present, the good news that he was going to share, was going to be offensive because it was going to call men and women to die to themselves and to live unto the Father and for the glory of his great name. And he just knew that is going to be offensive. And sadly, that offense is even going to get into the home and divide families. Paul saw it in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 21 through 23. He says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. Now I love Paul's words here and I have shared this on a number of occasions but Paul is basically saying I know going into every city and I know in sharing the gospel with whoever I do that the natural man cannot receive the things of God it is foolishness to him and I know when I start preaching Christ and him crucified immediately it is going to be foolishness to many and for many others it is going to be a stumbling block or it is going to be scandalous to them and they are going to dismiss it and again the pressure would be to alter the gospel to make it more appealing to man but Paul said I can't do that lest I make the cross of no effect He said, I've just had to accept that if I'm going to preach Christ, and I'm going to preach him crucified, and if I'm going to preach him as the only means by which man can be right with God, I am going to alienate many. They are going to find it foolish, 
Some are going to find it scandalous or again, as it says here, a stumbling block. Now, I want to just stop there for a moment. Stumbling block here meant, believe it or not, and like you're going to think I'm making this up, but I'm not. It literally means the movable stick or trigger of a trap. And we've all seen those traps that have this little stick and, and uh, it's set for the animal to walk through and then it trips that. That movable stick moves and it collapses upon the prey and you capture it. It's the trigger point. And that is what stumbling block. He was saying this is a trigger point for many men and women. It was referred to an impediment that was placed in the way that became an occasion for someone to stumble or to fall. And so literally, Paul was saying the gospel's a trigger. That there are just some people that the moment that they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and him crucified, they are going to be triggered. And it is true, because if you want to trigger some people today, just preach Christ and him crucified, and it won't be long before the fur is flying. I mean, that is just the way that it is. There is something about his life, his ministry, his miracles, his teachings, his commandments, his death, his resurrection, and even his glorious uh, ascension to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. They are so contrary to the culture of this 21st century that when you preach him in an uncompromised and unadulterated manner, it will trigger most everyone and move them to wokeness. And we just got to get comfortable with that. And again, I don't think that that means we should just go out and purposely try to offend people. That's not it at all. The gospel itself is offensive enough. We just need to resign within our heart that if we are going to share the gospel, and if we are going to be true to it, that it is going to trigger many people it's going to move them as i said a moment ago to a state of wokeness they are going to be upset i want you to watch this here really quickly first peter chapter 2 verse 7 and 8 says therefore to you who believe he is precious but to those who are disobedient the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Now, Peter is quoting two scriptures here. He's quoting Psalm 118 and verse 22 and Isaiah 8 and verse number 14. And basically what Peter is saying here is that everyone, everyone is building their lives on one of two foundations either sand or rock, as Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 7 in his Sermon on the Mount. And all of us are aware of that. Everyone is building their life, and they're building it on one of two foundations, either the sinking sand of this world or on the established rock, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And Peter says, as many have rejected Christ as the rock, they have opted to build upon the sand that obviously is going to fail them in the time of judgment. To them, though he is the rock and the only sure foundation, he has become to them the rock of offense. They are offended by him. They trip over him. They are triggered by him. And you might ask, well, why? And Peter tells us they're disobedient to the word of God. They, they don't want to hear what Jesus has to say. They don't want to live the way that Christ has called them to live. They don't want to have to conduct themselves as Christ has called them to conduct themselves. They do not want to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. They're offended, and so they would rather build their life upon the sinking sand and put themselves in eternal peril rather than actually submit themselves to the rock, Christ Jesus, and build their lives upon him. They're offended at his word, at his teaching, at his commandments, and Man, how many of us know people even today who have rejected Christ simply because they did not want to conform to Jesus Christ? They're offended 
because of the things that he has said. And we need to be careful that that same thing doesn't happen to us. We can become very offended because he has declared that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father except through him. And how many men and women have we heard through the years say, well, anyone that would claim exclusivity like that, I wouldn't want to be a part of him anyway. They're offended that he has taught that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we are to love our neighbor even as we love ourselves. It is highly offensive to them that they would actually have to put God first in all things. And they would have to prefer others above themselves. And live for the glory of God and for the building up of their fellow man. They, they're offended by that and offended that God would ever call them to live that way. We live in a culture today that are highly offended that when Jesus was asked about marriage and human sexuality, that he made it very clear that we were to humble ourselves under God's original and only plan. That in the very beginning, God created us male and female. And that for this very reason, a man is to leave his mother and father and be joined to his wife. And the two will then become one flesh. And what God has put together, no one is to put asunder or to divide. That Jesus in just one sentence actually revealed the plan of God on gender, on marriage, on human sexuality. And even divorce, saying that no man can divide what God has put together. I mean, everything that Christ needed to say about, again, sexuality, about gender, about marriage, and about divorce, it was all summed up in one single statement. And people are highly, highly offended that Jesus would say such things. And we could keep going on. We could talk about how people are offended that we can only be forgiven if we are forgiving those who have trespassed against us or that before we can offer our gift to the father that if we discover there at the altar that there is someone who has an offense with us that we're to go to them and we're to do our best to reconcile and then come back to the lord that's offensive to people it's offensive to people when they hear that they have to pray for their enemies that they have to bless those who despise them that highly offends them and it's so sad that we live in a culture today that does not want to hear the gospel because it so deeply offends them and becomes a trigger point in their life. And so Jesus himself told us that one of the clearest signs that we were drawing close to the coming of the Lord was an unbridled offense in the land. That people would be triggered and woke by the teachings of Jesus Christ. And that it will become so escalated that it will move from simple offense into hatred and then from hatred to betrayal and even betrayal of the worst kind. Even delivering those who um, are offending us to death and to execution. He says this is going to happen even on the most intimate levels. When Mark shared with us his understanding of the, uh, the Olivet Discourse in Mark chapter 13. Listen to what he says, Mark 13, 12 and 13. Now brother will betray brother to death, and father his child. Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. Listen to this, but he who endures how long to the end shall be saved. You know, he says that the betrayal will even hit the home. I've mentioned this before, but in Paul's warning to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that perilous times would come, he speaks of men and women becoming unloving. And I believe that it's in the King James Version where it says that they will be without natural affection. And that 
unlovingness that he is speaking of here is speaking of the natural love that you will find within the family. That's why he says without natural affection. He is talking primarily of marital love, of parental love, of paternal love, of maternal love. He's talking about that love that you would find uniquely within the family. He says in the last days will be perilous because the one place that you would think you could run to and find that love is going to be gone the family it's going to be torn apart and how true it is that today families are being torn apart over sin over the rejection of christ the hatred of the word of the lord and jesus tells us that this is going to escalate to the point where there is hatred in the home betrayal eventually family members will turn so hatefully against one another that they will turn each other over to death it's going to be a difficult time. And so Jesus says you need to be aware of this. That even though this is going to reach unbelievable levels um, in the tribulation, it's even going to be with us now before the rapture of the church. How do we overcome it? He tells us, endure to the end. <laughs> You've got to love that again. You know, Jesus just gets right to it he says endure what else am i going to tell you you know we would like four or five steps of things that we can do but he just says you're going to have to endure this this is not going to be easy and you're going to have to endure with it till the end you can't pray it away you can't take a class on it you can't go to a seminar you can't write out a check to your favorite ministry you got to endure to the end and there's nothing really else to add to that. You have to endure. The word endure there, I've always liked it because it's, it's the idea of abiding under, remaining under. And it is the idea that even though I am under the pressure and the struggle and the burden of this offense, I choose to remain true to the Lord. I'm going to stay. I am not going to go anywhere. I'm not abandoning my faith. No matter how difficult and painful this is, I am going to remain and believe that God is going to make a way where there seems to be no other way in Jesus' name. Now I have to tell you that this is the offense that most concerns me in this hour. It's an offense where we're offended by God. When we are offended because of God, because of who He is, because of what He commands us to do and our unwillingness to conform to His image. This is the offense of the hour. This is uh, happening even as we speak, as we watch many who are abandoning the true faith because they are offended by what this true faith calls them to. We get offended with something that we read or something that is preached to us or taught to us when we read the word of the Lord. We get offended because God doesn't move the way we want him to move or doesn't do what we want him to do. And really, that offense has been with us since the garden. It doesn't necessarily say that Adam was offended, but certainly there was a degree of offense when Adam you know, sinned against God and God came to him and Adam said, the woman that you gave me, certainly assigning blame to the Lord. And even Eve showed a little bit of offense when she was called out on her sin and, and she said, the serpent, who obviously had been made by God, he deceived me and I ate it. Certainly Cain followed suit. Cain was offended because the Lord did not accept his sacrifice, only his brother's. We could talk about Moses certainly had moments where he questioned God as to why he had chosen him to lead the children of Israel. Certain, certainly King David was offended by God when he was trying to return the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and God struck down a man named Uzzah who reached out and touched it. I think it's safe to say that all of us and even many in the Word of God experience times of frustration with God and that frustration maybe even led us to a moment of offense and I was thinking about it you know in in my study here today that there are really only two ways that you can you can deal with offense 
um, when it comes, in a negative way, I should say. There's only really two ways that you can respond to it negatively when you're offended. One way is to reinvent the Lord, to, to shape and form Him in a way that you're comfortable with, and to accept false teachings to this now, what would be a false God. And i got to tell you that it seems that Paul was very concerned about that one. You know, I was reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. He says, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Paul saw this day coming. Paul, Paul was, was cognizant of the fact that what will happen is as we draw closer to the coming of the Lord and men and women are offended with the authentic Christ and the authentic gospel and the authentic convicting power of the Holy Spirit that there would be these master craftsmen who would reshape and reform and recast Jesus in a way that was tolerable to most men and women, they would form and fashion, if you will, another Christ that was not the real Christ. And they would do the same with the Holy Spirit and the same with the gospel. They would retool and recast and refin uh, re reshape it in such a way that they were presenting a Christ, a gospel, and a spirit, but it was not the authentic Christ, authentic gospel, authentic spirit, and they would literally be drawn away, and they would tolerate it. Paul says, you're going to put up with it, and I know you are, and the reason you are is because you're finally going to have a Christ, a gospel, and a spirit that you're comfortable with that doesn't convict you, that doesn't push you to a place that you don't want to go to be the kind of person that you're called to be, it's going to be one that you're comfortable with and you're going to go after that. And we're seeing that happen right now where men and women are reforming, reshaping Christ, the gospel and the spirit. And it's not the spirit, it's not the gospel, it's not Christ. It is an idolatrous gospel and it's leading many people away. I'm going to tell you folks, this is a time to know the truth because only the truth is going to set you free. That's why we got to love the truth, buy it up and sell it not. Proverbs 23 and verse 23 says, buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Folks, I'm going to tell you, it's time to say that this truth is not for sale under any circumstance in Jesus' name. But the other way of dealing with offense when we're offended by the gospel is a departure from the faith altogether and i want to share with you very quickly here one of the saddest stories in the word of god jesus was surrounded by a multitude a multitude that really had just seen the feeding of the thousands at the hands of Jesus Christ, and they still were not satisfied. satisfied. They were still looking for another sign or wonder that they could be convinced um, by that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus basically said, you know what, we're not going to go there anymore. This is more than just signs and wonders. This is about an intimate relationship with God through me. And Later in John chapter 6, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Jesus was was calling them into such an intimate relationship with him that they would be one with him, that they would literally lose themselves in Christ. But it was only in that that they would be promised to be raised up from death to life in the last days. I mean, it was a radical, radical transformation. And no one had ever really talked to them like this. 
And that's why later on it says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? And so they just hear this, and instead of rejoicing, that they now have a way of knowing that they will be raised up in the last days. Instead, they start complaining about it and say, well, this is a hard saying. Who can tolerate this? Now, understand that when they said it's hard to understand this, they weren't saying that it's hard in the sense we can't figure it out. It was so hard to hear it that they couldn't accept it. It was that idea. They, They were basically saying, you know, this is so hard. We can't believe that you would actually require us to do this. It, it's so hard. Who can accept this call? That was the idea. It wasn't hard to understand. It was hard to accept because Jesus was being so exclusive and Jesus was creating such a narrow road to everlasting life. And they were just saying, this is so hard for us to accept. We can't believe that you would talk to us like that, that you would lay such demands upon us. Jesus was calling them to such an intimate fellowship with him that they knew it would be the end of themselves. It would require them to die to themselves and to live for the glory and for the honor of Almighty God. And it offended them and they started complaining about it to one another till the point where Jesus says, does this offend you? Because this isn't even the worst of it. I mean, this is offending you? I, I, I can't... I can't go any further with you if you're just going to keep being offended by these things. Sadly, in verse 66, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more, which I would take that they never returned to the Lord. Even after his resurrection, they chose never to walk with Christ again. And then Jesus turned to the twelve and he said, Do you also want to go away? Now, it seems to be, now we don't know this, but it seems to me that Jesus would have never asked that question if he had not detected that there was even some resistance in the heart of the twelve. Not that they were offended at the same level, but certainly there was something there that Jesus would turn to them and say, do you also want to go away? I mean, he could probably see that they were wrestling with some of these things himself. And so Jesus just looks at him and says, listen, guys, I'm not changing this gospel. This is the gospel that I came to deliver. And I know that the majority of them were so offended that they left me. And many of them, if not all of them, are never coming back to me again. So I'm going to ask right now. I'm not changing, so are you going to be offended as well, and do you want to go away? Now, you know, (laughs) Peter was known for putting his foot in his mouth, but there were some times that he made some profound statements, and this is one of them. Because Simon Peter answered Jesus in verse 68 and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And also we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God Almighty. I love that. Peter said, where would we go? (laughs) Only you have the words of eternal life. Only you have given us a gospel that promises us to be raised in the last days. You alone have the words of eternal life. So whether we're offended or not is irrelevant. It, it, it's not even pertinent to the conversation. Because where else would we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. So if we're offended, we just got to get over it. At, at some point, we've just got to move on from our offense because you alone have the words of eternal life. You know, as I was reading that the other day I I thought there comes a moment when you do have to resign yourself there is no other way I mean at at some point you just got to say it doesn't matter 
how offended I might be at the gospel. It doesn't matter that I have to give up all of these things so that I might live unto Jesus Christ. It, it, it doesn't matter what he requires of me. It, it, it's the only way to escape the judgment that is to come. So offended or not, he is the only way of escape. I've just got to move on. I've got to work that out in my own heart and, and, and get over that offense. And that's how we overcome it the positive way. There just comes a moment where you have to say, Father, where else are we going to go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You know, as I was driving home last night, I was just thinking about these things and I was reminded of something that the Apostle Paul wrote and it's the best that I can offer to you. Again, we would like to have a list of five or six things. You know, do this, do this, do this, do this and you won't have any offense in your life anymore. And, and, and sometimes it's just not that way. It, it, is, it is as simple as knowing the Lord intimately. Listen to what Paul said. In Philippians 3 and verse number 7, he says, But what things were gained to me, these things I now have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. You know, it makes those words even more powerful, as if they weren't powerful enough. But what makes them even more powerful is that they were written while Paul was imprisoned. You know, if Paul wrote those words from his beachfront property in, you know, Florida, it, then they would not have carried the same kind of weight. But when you consider that he is in prison as he is writing these, well, then it changes things. And he was. He was imprisoned for his faith in Jesus Christ. And he could have easily been in, offended by his chains. And he could have easily been offended by, by his imprisonment for the sake of the gospel. And, and could have easily said, Lord, why would you allow me to be arrested? And why would you allow me to be imprisoned? I, I don't understand it. He could have easily got offended. But he said, you know what? All the things that I once thought were gain, everything that I once thought was important, you know, I just, I, I counted it all as a loss because I have discovered that there is no greater treasure than the treasure of knowing the Lord. And having the fellowship of his sufferings, experiencing the power of his resurrection. And all I can tell you is that more often than not, the reason that we're offended, really with anything in life, is we're holding on to it too tightly. Because we make life all about this material world. And all about gaining something here. Instead of recognizing that the greatest treasure in life is knowing Christ. Is knowing Him. And counting everything else as loss in comparison to that knowledge. And I want to encourage you today. Are you holding on too tightly? Let it go. Just, just say, Father, take it all. What this world can offer me, take it all. 100 years from now, it won't matter anyhow. What this world can offer me, take it all, Lord. Take it all. Offense will come, folks. And there'll be times when you struggle even with the direction that God has taken in your life. What he's called you to. What he wants you to do. Where he wants you to go. What he wants you to endure. But the key is enduring. The key is letting go of life. And just saying, I want to know you more. 
and whatever is required for me to know you in a more intimate level, then I will pass through it in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you again for how it speaks to our hearts and our lives. Undoubtedly, Lord, someone is watching tonight or someone will watch in the future who has been offended at various levels in their life. And Lord, teach us that every time we feel that offense, it reminds us we're holding on to this world too tightly. I pray that we would begin to live lives where we count it all loss, that we might know you that our hunger and our thirst would be to know you in the fellowship of your suffering so that we might know you in the power of your resurrection so that we may live for your glory and for your honor. I pray, Father, for that one that is listening here today that is really struggling, it, struggling with it. They're, they're really going through that time of offense right now. I just pray that they would draw ever closer to you and that, Lord, they would cast that burden upon you because you care for them. I pray that they would let go of life and live only for your glory and honor and find the freedom that comes in that kind of intimacy with you. Help us in this critical hour that we live in to buy up the truth and sell it not, to hold fast to it no matter where it calls us to and how we're called to live by it. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. I've enjoyed my night with you. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And we'll talk to you really soon. God bless.